Well, good evening, and welcome to the Copernic Observatory and Science Center. Uh, it's great to see you all here this evening. Uh, we all know, also want to welcome those uh, people watching on our live stream. My name is Drew Desker. I'm the director of Copernic, and uh, it's great to see some very familiar faces. Also, a couple of uh, some new faces, at least for me. Um, who's here for the first time? Anyone? A couple of people? All right, very good. Um, well, uh, we just uh, last week started our uh, Friday night programs, and um, so every Friday night from March to mid-December, we will have somebody up here talking about some aspect of science or technology. And of course, uh, if it's clear, or even if it's slightly clear, we'll uh, invite you afterwards to uh, uh, out into the domes to be able to look uh, you know, through our scopes. Uh, tonight's going to be a little, little dicey, but I did uh, pop my head out very briefly, and I did see. Uh, 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 Crescent Moon and, uh, and Venus is out there. So, um, and also right now we're actually going through this uh, uh, time where we, uh, you call it, a, I guess you could call it a planetary alignment. There's uh, um, Mercury, Venus, Jupiter, and Mars, and, and if, you had a, if you had a scope, you'd see uh, Uranus as well. Uh, they're all, all in the sky. Um, uh, Actually, we, there was a, one of the TV stations was up here yesterday asking about it, and it actually happens more often than you think. <laughs> but uh, did anybody happen to see back a couple weeks ago was uh, uh, Venus and Jupiter were right next to each other, within about a half a half a degree of each other, and uh, it was, of course we got a couple of calls about that as well. Um, well, I, actually, I'd like to end up, actually have us dive straight into our, our presentation this evening. Well, actually, before we do that, let me actually talk about a couple of things that are coming up. Pardon me a second. Actually, um, tomorrow we're having a, an event called Brain Day. And it's actually, uh, uh, we're working with a, a group uh, uh, out of the Binghamton University, out of the psychi psychology department. And it's a bunch of graduate students who will be uh, doing some activities to sort of focus on what's going on between our two ears. And this is really aimed at, at uh, sort of school-aged children. We'll also have our... Uh, we're going to have an open house for our summer camp. So actually tomorrow, af uh, tomorrow afternoon, we open up registration for our, our summer camps, which will start in June and go through, uh, uh, through, uh, through mid-August. Uh, mid These are week-long camps for students entering second grade through 12th grade. And um, uh, always a lot of fun, and, uh, and you get to learn while you're doing it. Um, we've got a couple other things coming up down the road. Um, we do, um, uh, during the, the school break, there is a, uh, a program we call Go Power Science. And we really are, uh, we run this twice a year where we have uh, uh, young girls uh, between third and eighth grade come in and, and do some, as you know, learn about some aspect of science or technology. We always have a, um, a, uh, a subject matter expert, a female subject matter expert, talk about the work that they do. And a few years ago, we actually had a uh, uh, an astrophysicist from from NASA uh, zoom in for us, and uh, she was talking about the work that she does with um, satellites to look at uh, carbon dioxide levels and how that affects global warming. And of course, because it's a video conference, our girls get to ask them questions. And <clears throat> this one girl asked, "How did you get interested in astrophysics?" And her answer was great. She said, well, when I was in college, I was an English major. My boyfriend was a physics major. And we would go from observatory to observatory. I eventually dumped the boyfriend, but I kept the astronomy. So you never know where a seed's going to get planted. And, um, and that's really sort of what we're all about here. If any of you are runners, we, uh, or even if you're or walkers, uh, we, are, we have a, this would be the fifth year we are running our uh, race to the Stars. It's a 5K race that, that starts and ends here. It's on a Saturday evening on uh, April 20, 25th, I think, whatever that's the last Saturday in, um, <coughs> in, uh, in April. So if you're interested in um, doing that, it's a bit of a fundraiser for us, but it's, it's always a lot of fun. And of course, then we'll, we'll open up our, our domes uh, and, and scopes for that as well. And then finally, in uh, June, we'll be doing Rocket Fest. And this is uh, an opportunity for individuals or families to uh, build those little Estes rockets and then uh, so they'll build them at home and then uh, with some help from us and then you come up here and then you'll launch them from up here and uh, last year we we launched about 110 rockets so it's a it's a lot of fun a lot of fun 
But anyway, as I said, you know, every Friday night we do a public program, and uh, we're very fortunate to have uh, uh, a returning presenter, uh, uh, Professor Alex Nikulin from Binghamton University, and uh, uh, from the geology department. I'll let him introduce himself uh, uh, more accurately than I'm doing, and uh, uh, talking about uh, earthquakes. And, uh, and clearly, earthquakes are, uh, certainly have been on in the news uh, recently, but uh, it's been something that's been happening essentially forever, right? And so, uh, with that, we're going to turn it over to you. All right. Yep. No. All right, great, okay. Oh, I sound really weird. All right, um, so uh, thank you for, for having me back. Uh, I am, in fact, an associate professor over at Binghamton University, so just up the road. Uh, and I became a geologist for a simple reason that the stars terrify me. And um, every time I look up, I, I, I think about eternity, and it's very hard. So I prefer to look down, which turns out to be uh, actually quite exciting because it turns out we don't know much about our planet through direct observations because we happen to live on the surface of the planet. And it's actually very hard to look uh, below. But uh, so today you're um, going to essentially experience uh, a one hour crash course that covers about two semesters of introductory and advanced geophysics and geology. So buckle in, we'll try this. Um, the only thing is I can't seem to find this uh, presentation. I was wondering if you could uh, pop that up. Yeah, sorry. Uh, oh, there you go. Okay. All right, cool. So we will basically talk about the Two type two out of, the, out of the three types of earthquakes that humans may experience uh, in their lifetimes, and um, they are tectonic, so natural or naturally occurring large earthquake related to the process of plate tectonics. We will talk a little bit about induced seismicity, uh, which has been tied into some of the hydrocarbon development that we've been doing here in the U.S. and it's kind of it's a growing concern, uh, but also it's a concern that could be mitigated. And there is another one which I kind of grayed out because we do have kids in the audience. So we will not be talking about the nuclear uh, earthquakes uh, that are related to uh, nuclear weapons testing, nuclear test bed treaty verification. But that's something that's uh, something we will actually probably do another time. So two topics, and uh, they will feature. Of course, we'll talk about Turkey, and we will talk about some of the things going on in Oklahoma. All right. So you've probably seen this before, even even the kids, right? Flashbacks to Earth science, hopefully, right? Everybody's used to this, this uh, picture of the Earth, right? We have the core, inner core, outer core, mantle, crust, okay? And those are the layers of the Earth. And the problem is, is that we kind of get in, ingrained in this, and we forget that the Earth is not actually a stationary, static planet. The planet is alive. What does that mean? So. The Earth formed as heavier, denser, more radioactive minerals and uh, elements migrated towards the center of the planet. Lighter stuff migrated to the outside of this, this spherical shape. In the end, you end up with this diagram. But what is forgotten is that the core is hot and is, wants to emit heat. So the core is, the outer core is molten it is ready to give off heat. And the way it does that most effectively is through something called planetary convection. Essentially, the core, this is the, this is the, uh, um, the image you're mostly uh, likely used to. The core is also a physical layer, but it's also a compositional layer. So what does that mean? That means that it is iron, but it is also hot. And it behaves like a hot object. And, and as this does that, it gives off heat in a convecting pattern. You've seen this before every time you cook chili for Halloween or for Turkey Day, right? What does a chili do? Is it stationary? No. Chili slowly, slowly convects, right? It's this very mushy substance. Now imagine a bowl of chili in 3D in space. Hot in the inside, slowly convecting to the outside. And this gives us this remarkable mechanism that is active on this planet called convection, right? And again, gravity 
As things heat up, materials lose density, they start rising. Cold material sinks, warm material rises. Why? Because the earth is warmer inside and it's giving off heat. This is a process. This process takes millions of years. It's very hard to imagine this on a human scale because, again, if we're lucky, 100 years, right? Everybody? Good? Right? That's a moment in geology. But over millions of years, uh, continents are being pushed around basically by this process. And the rigid outer part of the Earth is constantly being moved and rearranged. And this is the process of plate tectonics. Essentially, again, all coming back to this little tiny convection model that you can observe easily in your kitchen. Okay. So here we go. We have convection cells rising, splitting up. As material sinks, it wants to fall back down. So we have places where we have new material, new, new plate material being formed. That is called a divergent boundary or constructive boundary. This is the mid-ocean ridges. Okay. And then we have convergent boundaries where plates collide. Right. And here is a general picture of the Earth, but not a map like you've seen before. This is a map of actually all the plates that are out there. All the continental, all, all the oceanic plates that are moving around. And again, this is a somewhat of a random process because convection just pushes these plates around. And you can see that some plates and some continents are the same thing. Some are not. All right, if you look at the Australian plate, the plate itself is much bigger than the continent. If you look at the US plate, right here's, a, here's us right there. Right? You can see that there actually, our plate extends all the way to the middle of the Atlantic Ridge. And we neatly fit right here onto Africa. And of course, anybody who has ever cut out South American can always glue it right to Africa. Right? So things are moving around. And we see evidence of that in both geophysics, but both in geology and all sorts of things. Okay? All right, so that's, that's plate tectonics. This is something we only figured out right around the 1960s. So this is relatively new. But this guides all of geological activity, all of it, from earthquakes to volcanoes to you know, distribution of species and so on and so forth. Okay? Here are some animations of this through time. You can see the age ticking. Right out here. So you can see kind of millions of years ticking right there. And you can see continents separating, coming together, oceans drying up. Okay. South America getting further and further away from Africa. Okay. And there is the, if you ever cross the uh, George Washington Bridge, you will see the beautiful Palisade Sill. This is where the continental broke up from Africa. This is the point of breaking. Okay, so pretty neat. Oops, sorry. One hit. All right, and then if we have plates, we have plate boundaries, areas where plates run into other plates. Okay, so imagine a parking lot full of cars skating on thin ice. Okay, problem, problem. Eventually, plates collide, and they collide in spectacular fashion. And if you plot all the earthquakes out there, and I'll show you more and more of these, you will see that all the earthquakes mostly, mostly, not all of them, but they mostly will fall right along plate boundaries. So here's Australia. Here's the plate boundary of Australia. You can see all the earthquakes that surround it. Okay. So um, types of plate boundaries, there are basically three. Divergent boundaries, where new material is rising. There's a convection cell rising. These are the mid-ocean ridges, so things are moving apart. They're separating. Convergent boundaries, this is where a plate meets another plate head on. Okay? This can happen in three different ways. It can be an oceanic to oceanic collision, an oceanic to continental, and continental to continental. So continental to continental, this is, a this is when you have two big trucks running into each other head on. So think of the world's tallest mountains. Anyone? Mount Everest? Yeah, you got it. What are they? Oh. Tallest mountain. Mount there you go. Mount Everest is a result of two continental plates, India and Asia, colliding into each other. With, uh, uh, and uh, Mount Everest is a result of that. Good. Great. And last but not least, 
we have transform boundaries. This is where sl uh, plates slide side by side. Okay? And the interesting thing is we have all three types right here in, the, in North America. We have a divergent boundary forming in Baja, California, so right south of the U.S.-Mexico border. We have a convergent plate boundary. This is all of Alaska, the Aleutian Islands. All of that is a giant convergent boundary. And we have the world's most famous transform boundary, the San Andreas, right there in California. Okay? And earthquakes are basically a result of material being deformed as a result of motion. And wherever you have motion, wherever you have tectonic motion, you will have material that gets stuck in between the plates. Okay? So imagine a giant motor, lots of gears, and all of a sudden, you throw some walnuts at it. The gears are going to keep turning. They're, you can't stop those gears. Plate tectonics cannot be stopped. It is the most powerful force in the world. But you may introduce little bits of tension, little bits of material, rock masses that get stuck between these gears of plates. Okay? And when that happens, that material behaves in a way you don't imagine rocks behaving. There's three ways that material can deform. Plastic, this is Play-Doh. Gum, right? Whatever pressure you put on gum, it will take that shape. Okay? Brittle, glass. If you throw a hammer at a glass window, the glass will just break. It cannot take any shape in response to stress. And last but not least, the form of elastic deformation. Okay? Elastic deformation is when you put pressure on the material and it starts bending. But the second you take that pressure off, it bounces right back into its original shape. Okay? And the more energy you put in, that energy is stored as elastic energy. Okay? Now, imagine I'm Superman <laughs> and I keep squeezing this. I put more and more and more pressure on it. What's going to happen eventually? It will snap, right? Elastic material snaps. And at that moment, all the energy, all the pressure I put on that material is instantaneously released. Instantaneously. Earthquakes are the only thing in geosciences that happens instantaneously. They happen in an instant. It's the only thing we get to experience in geology on a human time, time scale. It's not a good thing. <laughs> but it's the only process that is like that, which makes kind of earthquakes pretty spectacular. So rocks do bend. They just bend at a depth that is not the surface. So again, if you go outside, you start trying to bend rocks, you're not going to succeed, right? Because rocks on the surface are brittle. Rocks at depth are plastic. You know, the core is liquid. You can't do anything with it. But as you get to about a depth of about 15 kilometers, 15 to about 50 kilometers in the crust, you, rocks are attaining elastic properties. They're able to store up stress. They're able to store up stress and then release that stress if there is a breaking point. And we talk about elastic stuff. When we talk about elastic materials, you know, somebody in the in it says, like, well, but if you take the pressure off, it goes back to its original shape, right? That happens in the physics lab. In reality, that doesn't happen. The gears of geology never stop. The pressure is never off geological materials. Eventually, it'll lead, they will all lead to elastic failure and a release of energy, which is what an earthquake is. So an earthquake is a release of energy at some point below the surface. Okay? And the best way to visualize this, you've all thrown rocks at a pond. But again, imagine a pond in 3D. Imagine that wave energy expanding in all three directions. This is what happens at a focus of an earthquake, which is below ground. Okay? And uh, welcome to a life of perpetual annoyance, because the media will always get this wrong. Okay? The epicenter of the earthquake is at the surface. This is where the first energy from the focus hits the surface. Okay? The focus is at depth. And you will always hear on the news that the epicenter of an earthquake was 15 kilometers below. No, no. The epicenter is at the surface. It doesn't have a depth dimension. The focus does. Just a little fun fact. Okay? All right. So. We have faults related to usually plate boundaries, where some, some material gets stuck. 
eventually it is broken, the energy is released. This is called stick-slip behavior, and it is common across all boundaries. Essentially, the boundaries are moving, and there are bits and pieces that get stuck in them, rock masses that are elastic, which store up energy, which then release them. Okay? And we, as geologists and geophysicists, are able to use that energy to actually learn something about the Earth. We record that energy. You've all seen this kind of classic, you know, it's in every single disaster movie, right? The seismogram moving, this is a seismograph. Uh, this is probably right around 1950s. That's what they look like. They're physical. As the Earth moves beneath them, they record the Earth's vibration. Today, we use digital seismometers. Actually, every single one of you carried it here, except for the kids, hopefully. Your phone. Your phone can act as a three-component seismometer. You're welcome to install an app from the USGS that will turn it into one. That's how, it that's how, that's how a phone knows how to turn the screen. Right? There's a three-component three of motion sensor in every single one of your phones. And it will record that. Okay? So here is a modern seismometer. Okay? Here is a record of motion on three components. So east, west, north, south, up and down. And here is a record, a seismogram that is recorded. Okay? And what can we learn from a seismogram? Okay? There are multiple things. And again, uh, this is... You know, we, we have entire graduate courses on seismogram analysis, but we will talk about one thing today. We will talk about the size, the amplitude of a seismogram, because that is the magnitude of an earthquake. The magnitude of an earthquake is defined as the largest squiggle on a seismogram that it made. That's it. Okay? And of course, the person who figured this out is Charles Richter. Charles Richter is the first person who identified that, you know, the, basically the energy of an earthquake can be related to the highest amplitude of a produced seismogram, related, correlated. And if it helps, this is kind of like the amplitude of your car radio. The louder you make it, the more energy you, your speakers are putting out. Right? This is volume. This is the volume. It's exactly the same thing. When you're increasing the volume of your favorite song, you're increasing the amplitude of the vibrations. Vibrations of sound are seismic waves. They're the same exact thing as a wave of energy below the surface. Okay? The reason you're able to hear me, because with my voice, is my, my, my throat is making vibrations that go to your eardrums, that vibrate, and your brain processes that as sound. Every single one of you is basically a seismometer. Okay? <laughs> All right. So this is the other thing you take away from this, our, our little intro, intro to everything lecture. And this is the most important thing you need to know about the Richter scale, this little three-letter thing, log. Richter had a problem. If he started plotting all the seismograms that he was recording at, in California in the 30s and the 40s, the scales were, would go from 1 to, I don't know, 16 million. To correct for that, he made the Richter scale a logarithmic scale. Okay? And this is something, again, that everybody needs to know. So what does that mean? That means that the scale is rigged. Basically, here is the actual Richter scale. It is made so that if you have an earthquake that is 100 kilometers away, okay, right here, uh, distance here, it is 100 kilometers that makes a wiggle of one millimeter right here. We position the Richter scale, here it is, to give that a magnitude of three. What you will see here is that this is not linear and neither is this. Okay? So what does that mean? I know people are scared of logs. It's okay. So am I. That's why I'm not a mathematician. Okay? What does that mean? Simple answer. Every point on the Richter scale is 10 times larger than the point before. Okay, you guys ready? Math test. A magnitude 3 is 10 times larger than a magnitude 2. A magnitude 4 is 10 times larger than a magnitude 3. How much larger is a magnitude 4 than a magnitude 2? 100 times bigger. Good, awesome, right? So, two orders of magnitude for every Step. Great job. Your kids are awesome. All right, this is good. <laughs> All right. So, and this, is, this becomes a, a, a huge 
problem slash issue because when people think of the Richter scale, they kind of think that, oh, a 4 and a 5 is the same thing. And a 7 and a 5 is kind of the same thing. It's not. Here is what the Richter scale is, and here is the correspondent TNT equivalent of an earthquake. Okay? So an earthquake of a magnitude 4 is about 12,000 12, uh, 12, pounds of TNT. Okay? As you go up in the value, you get a 10 time gain every single time. When you're talking about magnitude sixes, you're talking about the atomic bomb that was dropped on Hiroshima. When you get up to eights, you're talking about the largest nuclear test ever conducted. When you get up to nine, that is four trillion pounds of TNT energy equivalent released. Okay? And when an earthquake like that hits an area, it is, we need a very quick way to figure out right, how bad was it. Because it turns out that there's not really, there is a little bit of a correlation between earthquake magnitude. Obviously, if a magnitude 10 hits anywhere in the world, it will be destructive. But it's these mid-ranges here that have very different consequences depending on the area that is impacted, depending on the area of preparedness, on its history of earthquakes, on its building codes, for example. Okay? And we have a Mercalli scale. Mercalli scale basically says, okay, what actually happened in response to magnitude something earthquake? Okay? This one's simple. We just go from 1 to 10 and it goes, okay, not felt to weak to light to moderate. When you're getting to kind of the mid-ranges, you're going from people's perception of things to damage, actual physical damage. Okay? So right around 6, okay, everybody felt it. Some heavy furniture moved. A few instances of fallen plaster, damage slight. Once you get to, you know, magnitude 8 on the Mercalli scale, damage slight is specific designated st structures, but you're damaging things that are not prepared for an earthquake. Okay? And let me give you an example of that. This is, this is a rough one. Okay? But here is Haiti 2010, Japan 2010. You've all heard of the Haiti earthquake, I'm assuming, right? Those of you who are around. Okay? Uh, very, very significant damage, significant death tolls. Okay? The same year, there was a magnitude tw to 7, so exactly the same magnitude in Japan where there were no reports of damage or loss of life. Why? Different levels of preparedness, different levels of expectations of an earthquake. Japan, every single building is ready for a magnitude 9. Why? Because Japan sits on an active plate boundary. Haiti, not so much. Okay? So I'll give you, I'll, 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 I'll let this kind of hit home a little bit. If there's a magnitude 6 in California tonight, it will barely make the local news. If there's a magnitude 6 in Binghamton, <laughs> it will be really, really bad. <laughs> because again, we do not have a history of earthquakes here, and we don't have a level of preparedness. Which brings us to this map. Okay? Here are all the played boundaries, and here are two locations, Turkey and eastern seaboard of the US, or mid-continent. Okay? We expect earthquakes in Turkey. We know they're happening. We are not expecting earthquakes in the mid-continent of the US because, again, mid-continent. That's away from plate boundaries. Okay? So let's go to the Turkey one first, so just to give us this context. Okay? So here's, a, here's the earthquake. Here's, a, here's where the earthquake happened. This is the um, one from a, about a month ago, okay, seven and a half, seven point eight, right here, okay. You can see that it was literally on the fault. So the, this fault is well known. It is well mapped, okay. An eight is a very very high number. Anytime you see anything close to an eight, seven point eight is pretty close to an eight. It's the, the damage is near total, okay. So here's an example of two different buildings. You can see that the newer buildings are meant to withstand shaking from an earthquake, and the older buildings are not. And remember, 
This is not necessarily the fault of a government or of a city or of a, or of a construction company. We did not understand plate tectonics until about 1965 in the US. And it became kind of a global, globally accepted theory, theory only about in the 70s and 80s. So anything constructed pre that just did not take this into account. Okay. Here is the Mercalli scale, the felt scale around the earthquake. You can see that the closer you get to the epicenter, the more extreme the shaking is. And as you dissipate away, just like a bubble of energy, just like a rock sinking into the lake and making waves, you can see that you have less and less and less amount of that. You can see it's not, it's not entirely even. You can see there are areas that are slightly more affected. And this usually has to do with local site conditions and local geology. Pretty interesting. Okay, Here is 7.5 that followed. And you have a 7.5 aftershock after a 7.8 main shock. That's really bad luck. Because essentially, your, all your structures are already weakened. And um, typically, we consider that aftershocks should be one magnitude down from the main shock. And here, they were almost, almost the same. So that's just really, really bad. Okay, uh, Here again, here are the plates. Okay, you can see that this is a. Um, here are the plate boundaries. You can see that they, we have both convergence and transform faulting in there. So these are these are pretty strong earthquakes that do occur here. Okay. Here are again. Here are the plates. Here are the plate separations. We have the all the different moving around. Okay. And here are the two earthquakes that occurred. Okay. Not unexpected. This is where we expect earthquakes. This is where again you saw those buildings, the newer ones, unscathed. Okay. So. In summary of, of natural earthquakes, general areas of possible seismicity are pretty easy to predict. As long as you understand uh, where your plate boundaries are, you can understand where earthquakes will happen. Within all of our lifetimes, there will be an earthquake in California. There's probably one tonight, a small one. But there will be a big one. We all, you will all, we will all see it. Okay. Um, the problem is that there are some areas of tectonic stability that may contain unreleased stress. Usually that stress is not as strong as those areas that are actively deforming. But we had that earthquake in Buffalo on the same day as the earthquake in Turkey. Unrelated, that's a coincidence. There are about a million earthquakes that occur a year. Most are on the lower scales. How big was the one in Buffalo? Who remembers? Yeah, I think it was a, so let's, let's, let's say a four. Okay. So it was right at that, at that felt level. You feel, uh, humans are usually feeling earthquakes that are right at about four. So four in Buffalo and eight in Turkey. How much bigger is an eight than a four? Yeah, right? And that's the difference. And that's why uh, my friends who, who know me, they know me you know, not to text me things about you know, magnitude threes or fours or fives. Text me when there's six. Call me if there's a seven. Run to my house and wake me up if there's an eight. Uh, because it's 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 bad. That, that this these are, this is my own personal scale, <laughs> but remember, uh, there's one thing you take away from this from this from this kind of our, our little lecture today is that the magnitude is a logarithmic scale. Yeah. Okay. Oh, predictions. Um, earthquake forecasts are easy, but earthquakes predictions are hard to impossible. And the famous quote by Charles Richter is that only fools, liars, and charlatans predict earthquakes. Uh, there are too many variables involved in knowing the timing of a specific earthquake. It is, uh, the, the, there's a very long mathematical explanation as to why that is. Uh, but basically, there are too many factors that determine the timing of an earthquake. And yes, people have successfully predicted earthquakes before. The same way that a, uh, a broken clock is right twice a day. Right. Uh, and if you predict that there's going to be an earthquake in California every day, eventually you'll be right. Okay. And here's a foolproof way to know that somebody is lying when they invoke the stars. The gravitational field of the moon or the stars, and we try to relate that to earthquake predictions. That's that's a tale as old as time. 
Anytime there's lunar lunar alignment, anytime there's planetary alignment, there's going to be there's some wacko out there that will tell you that this is when you, there's going to be an earthquake somewhere. Because it kind of makes sense, right? In our minds, gravitational fields, you have uh, plates moving. There's uh, so it doesn't work. The gravitational field of the planet it is too weak to impact anything below the surface. So that's just one of those things. Okay. But nice tries. All right. So. All the earthquakes around the plates, but we do have earthquakes in the middle of a continent. And this is where we get to this other topic of today uh, that is keeping you from the telescopes. Uh, and this is the notion of induced seismicity. Induced seismicity is any size seismicity that is triggered or caused by human activity. Uh, and this, you know, we, we, we know this happens a lot from quarry blasts to mining to geothermal to hydrocarbon development. But there is something new, a beast that appeared right around 2008 that kind of changed our perception of how big of a problem induced seismicity is. So I'll tell you some, some fun stories here. Okay. So here is your basic um, wastewater treatment plant. Right? Uh, if you're treating water, either municipal water, um, industrial water, uh, produced water from an oil well, you have a, a choice. Either you take that water, you process it, clean it to the best of your abilities, and dump it in the river. Option A. <laughs> Option B is to take that water and pump it deep into the ground, way below the aquifer, so you're way below the drinking water table, out of mind, out of sight, miles deep, somewhere where there is a porous rock where you can just dump that water in. Okay? Which one do you want for your town's water? Injection or dumping it back into the river? Yeah. Injection. Injection, right. And that's when, most peop that's when most people decide is a good idea. Right? And we've been doing this forever. We knew that sometimes this causes problems. Because if you're injecting too deep at too high rates, you might, ha might trigger, you might lubricate a fault that you didn't know was there, and all of a sudden shift the balance of uh, geological forces and trigger an earthquake. And we have knew this forever. We actually we, we, we played around with it. They used to give us money for this kind of stuff. In uh, Rocky Mountain Arsenal, uh, where we literally just pumped water into deep uh, Colorado mountains and saw what happened. And we pretty, got pretty good at figuring out, OK, there's a delay time, and we can trigger pretty big earthquakes. And we knew that it was related to the amount of fuel fluid you pump. And here are all the other ones that have happened. Dallas Airport, Magnitude 3.3, 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011, Arkansas 4.7, Youngstone, Ohio had a magnitude 4 earthquake in 2011. So all of a sudden, there are more of these earthquakes right around 2008, 2009, 2010, 2011. What's happening? Okay. Well, this is happening. Okay. Right around 2010, 2008, we figured out how to produce shale gas from tight shale reservoirs, the big F word. Fracking, right? Fracking is a process of extraction of uh, resources, of, of hydrocarbon resources from tight, previously unproductive shales. And the problem, well, not a problem, a feature of that process is you have a lot of wastewater that is produces, that's produced as part of that. Wastewater that needs to be put somewhere, you know, a million gallons per well. So all of a sudden, we have an issue of lots of dirty water at the surface that needs to get put somewhere. And we thought a great idea was injection. right? So we start injecting water at very high rates back into, so this is fracking. So fracking extracts. Now you have all this wastewater that you're moving to an injection site and injecting beneath where you produced into some sort of a porous rock. So this is not fracking. It's an important difference. Injection is not fracking. It's taking the fluids from a frac well, putting them into a wastewater disposal well, and under high pressure, re-injecting it back below, even further below from where you produced the resource in the first place. And this is happening everywhere. And um, 
The problem is that all of a sudden you're dramatically increasing the, the volumes of water that these wells were not necessarily designed for. They were not designed to take this much water at such high rates without causing some issues. And all of a sudden, we have lots and lots of earthquakes. All of a sudden, in the continental US, we go from having about 21 magnitude 3 events per year to 31 in 1980 to 150 in 2008. OK? Eh, magnitude 3. Who cares? Right? But there are 4s, and there are 5s, and there are 6s in there in that over 3 category. And again, no, these are not you know, magnitude 8s, and they're not magnitude 9s. But what happens if there's a magnitude 6 that strikes, for example, a petroleum pipeline beneath the surface, a plane that's about to land, a train that is rolling at 100 miles an hour? Okay? So there, there, there are issues that are associated even with the smaller scale earthquakes, especially in, in, in a, in a, in a post-industrial nation like ours, where there's a lot of uh, infrastructure that is not meant to withstand this. And again, these are happening not in California, where the infrastructure is ready for low levels of seismicity. This is the mid-continent, Oklahoma, Texas, Arkansas, anywhere where there's production of oil. Youngstown, Ohio. Youngstown. Hmm. Keep that one in mind. Okay. Here are the Oklahoma magnitude 2.8 earthquakes. Okay, 09, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. This is where we figured out fracking, right around here. And we have earthquakes going off the charts. Here's a fun one. This is the rig count. This is the number of rigs operating in the US. It's a close corollary to the amount of basically oil production that we do. Okay. Earthquakes, rig count. <laughs> See the same similarity? Of course, it's pretty obvious, right? What happens here? What happens at the rate count here? This is the big financial crisis. This is the big oil bust of 2015. This is where we drilled so much oil, we flooded the market with it. Okay? And all of a sudden, we're not drilling anymore. And all of a sudden, we're not injecting anymore. And all of a sudden, the earthquakes go down as well. Okay? So what about our backyard? Uh, anybody here from? Yeah. There are not. Right, so the nature of these earthquakes has to be somewhat different than the ones that are happening. Yes. The so these are, this is called remnant stress. So, uh, so even in the mid continents, there's remnant stress that was left over or carried over from plate boundaries. And usually these are areas where there is still some, er, uh, there are still some faults remaining. And actually, Oklahoma, there are faults that were active in the New Madrid earthquake of uh, the 1800s. So there are earthquakes that do happen away from plate boundaries. They're just, they're less frequent. They're more rare. So that's a very good question. Again, we were not ready for this. We, nobody expected Oklahoma to have more earthquakes than California. Okay? So this is the Marcellus. This is the production from the Marcellus. Where's the Marcellus? <laughs> yeah, uh, a mile that way and about, <laughs> right? Uh, it's Yeah, it outcrops in Syracuse, yeah. But uh, obviously everybody has, knows about Pennsylvania because Pennsylvania uh, has fracking, right? So if you're seeing this in production, what would you expect for the earthquake count to be? It's a trick question. Well, watch this. Here is the total number of earthquakes in Pennsylvania from 1987 to 2015. Look at the count. They're not there. Why? Why are they not there? Why, why? Yes! Where are they injecting all of the Pennsylvania's wastewater? Closer. Next, next Ohio. Uh huh. All of most of Pennsylvania's wastewater is struck to Ohio, and it's injected in Ohio, and that's why they have the earthquakes. And so that's an interesting story. 
And I think I just gave, I just gave away our class project, but shh. <laughs> OK. All right, so uh, down the road, if we do start injecting in Pennsylvania, we, we, may, we, we may see a different picture. But for now, uh, it's, 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 it is what it is. Okay? So that's something to be aware of. Now, and this is where, uh, you know, when we were first talking about this in 2010 and 2011, 2014, 15, 16, there was, a, there was a sense of, oh, this is just like climate change. This is unfixable. This is just an attribute of production. Well, no, that's not exactly true. Okay? Most injection whales out there do not trigger earthquakes. Only a few a minority does. And again, we played around with this since the 50s. We understand how this works. The more injection you have, the more volume you have, the more likely you are to lubricate a fault because you're, you're not dissipating the pressure fast enough from your well. So how do you dissipate the pressure from the well? You turn down the volume. You turn down the rate of injection. And most states that have this problem introduce a so-called traffic light system. For example, in Oklahoma, if you drill an injection well, you start injecting, you trigger an earthquake, you bring down the rate. If you're still causing earthquakes, you shut down the injection well, and you drill somewhere else. Okay. So fracking in and of itself is not really, re it's, it's indirectly responsible for this increase. It's actually more the, it has everything to do with injection. Uh, but um, unlike tectonic earthquakes, where we really don't fully understand when they will happen, with induced earthquakes are well understood and their risk can and should be managed. It's not rocket science. See what I did there? <laughs> it's not rocket science. It is actually a pretty well understood process. And this is something that is manageable at a regulatory and state level to do that. So if you kind of hear about injected earthquakes, just kind of keep in mind that this, we understand this one pretty well, and there's no reason to trigger earthquakes. Just you have to be more careful about it. And that's why we haven't heard too many stories about these in the last you know, f two years or so, because we, we figured out, OK, we need to calm down with, with the rates and kind of redistribute the water. And yes, sometimes it's going to cost the company more to drive it somewhere else. That's OK. okay. So tectonic earthquakes near tectonic boundaries, Mid-continental earthquakes, some are associated with remnant stress, some are associated with injection. Okay? But these are the two earthquakes that we kind of talked about today. And hopefully, um, the next time we ask to put a uh, seismic station on your property, you will let us in. <laughs> uh, because we are very grateful to the Copernic Observatory for hosting our seismic stations. Uh, they're actually right out there. Uh, so we, I can, there, there are not much to see. It's a, it's a solar panel sticking out of the ground. Most of the equipment is buried below the, below the surface. There's a seismometer, cable, GPS receiver uh, for timing, some, some batteries, some, uh, some rocks to hold everything down. Um, and that's what we do. So thank you so much for having me. And I hope you uh, had a good time. Yeah. Here we go. All right, I guess uh, at this point, are there any questions here? Uh, I'm going to bring the mic over so that the people in the live stream can hear. Yeah, I, after the recent earthquakes in Turkey, I, I heard that the government was uh, ginned up a whole lot of lawsuits. And I think it's, it was because that a, a lot of people that built buildings after we knew what it was all about weren't following the code. Yeah. Is, that, is that what you understand? Yeah. So there's, there's a saying, there's kind of a dark saying in, in geophysics that earthquakes don't kill people. Buildings kill people. Okay? If you're standing in the middle of a field and a 9.5 earthquake strikes, you're not going to get shaken to death. Yeah, it'll be fun. Uh, but you know, you're, you're like, as long as there's nothing falling on you, you're okay. But what was the, 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 the death toll in Turkey was close to, it's over 50,000 by now. And it's all related to uh, structures. And in areas like Turkey, again, Turkey is not, it's not a poor country. Um, we understand how this works. And again, you saw some of those buildings, the ones that are built properly withstand, should withstand the seven. In Japan, uh, most, uh, I believe most uh, buildings are rated up to, up to an 8.5, which is an incredible force. 
but they're meant to withstand that. To do that, your buildings uh, have to have um, they have to have flexibility. So instead of instead of um, kind of being knocked out, so like the if the if the if all of a sudden an earthquake wave moves your foundation, you know, ten feet over, the entire building has to be able to sway. This was actually uh, shown oddly enough in uh, the San Andreas movie featuring The Rock. Mm -hmm. uh, so you could actually see the building swaying in that, which is actually pretty accurate. That was a cool part of that, which we appreciated, uh, because disaster movies are always, you know, are a thorn in our side. But yes, you're you're absolutely right. And the same thing in Haiti, by the way. It was the same exact issue. I think there's actually, um, I recall, uh, you know, if you're a WSKG member uh, and you have that passport, I believe there was actually a uh, um, a Nova special on building designs around um, uh, earthquake design and, and how that would. I uh actually wanted to show you one. It's actually here. I just didn't, I didn't draw your attention to it uh, really quickly. Up oh, right there it is. So here's an earthquake design. This is an earthquake design for coastal Japan. You can see that the building is literally tied down with uh, metal tie downs, <laughs> wow. which is an interesting one. That's a new design they're testing. Uh, if, uh, so this, 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 that's a pretty famous building. It's actually right near the coast, and it's also meant to double as a tsunami shelter. So the roof is flat, so that people can get up on the roof. If there's a tsunami. So it's right. The the, the ocean is right there. Yeah. So what happened in Fukushima? Uh, they put a they put a nuclear power plant on a fault line. It's it's <laughs> that's you know. Well, I see. So, so that's a, that's a human error. They, they was not considered to be within striking distance, and it was. Right, any other questions here in, in the? Oh, we got one here. Hold on, one. Yeah. I don't know. If, I don't know if my question is going to make any sense, but I wanted to know more about like remnant stress. Is it from, just kind of the the compression from mm -hmm. all of the faults? Yeah. So the, the the best analogy I can give you, you know, you know when that random dish falls in your kitchen, like out of nowhere. That's kind of what remnant stress is like. It's, it's something that was it's out of balance, but it's very, very slow. And it's, uh, maybe that earthquake should have gone off you know, two million years ago, but it just didn't. Um, but it's, it's, it just takes so little to trigger those sometimes that we do have these. Even in New York State, we had, uh, I think we had magnitude sixes in the 1800s, uh, a few of them. So we're not totally out of the, kind of out of the woodworks. It, it doesn't really matter where you are. Like, so there are, there's usually remnant stress even in the mid-continent from, kind of, from that continent being pu pushed around by, the, by plate tectonics for you know, millennia. So yeah, there's, uh, we've had, the, there was an earthquake in DC, I believe it was 2007, which was felt all the way up the seaboard. Uh, so we, we have earthquakes, again, and they're mostly remnant stress. Usually, again, it's about size. Usually, it'll be a cool story to tell. Uh, no, nothing dangerous. All right, we do have one question, at least from the uh, from the live stream. Yeah. So, uh, one of our viewers wants to know more about uh, the possibility of Africa splitting over time. Oh, it's not a possibility. That's yeah. it's, it's it's very much a certainty. Uh, hmm. uh, Africa is splitting. Uh, all the the lakes of Africa are actually they're they're a, a rift. So Africa is being split up by a divergent plate boundary. Um, you can actually see it in, um, if you go to Google Maps, you can literally see where Africa is splitting. The Red Sea is part of that rift, so, yeah. I have a question, um, actually to, to you guys. It's, ha, have any of you actually experienced an earthquake? Mm -hmm. Oh, a few, a few yeah, of you, all right. Cool. Uh, anyone care to share the, what the experience was? I, I, I did. I, I, when I was living in Boston, it was the only reason I knew that it was an earthquake going on was that I was in my kitchen and I heard glasses clinking. Yep. yep. And that, that, you know, I didn't feel anything. It was only that the, the glasses in the cabinet were just clinking a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, anybody have a similar situation? Yeah, a couple? And, Vestal. Or here in Vestal. Many, many years ago. Okay, hold on. I was laying in bed, and the windows, I, the windows were rattling, mm -hmm. and I th immediately thought it was a, a truck going down the road or something. Yeah. No, and then I later 
heard on the news that there was an earthquake. So I don't know how many years ago it was. It was many yeah. years ago. Actually, I have, a, I have a very similar story. I was I was in California, and you know, I, I already had a PhD in earthquakes. I never felt an earthquake. Uh, but we lived near a railroad, and I was sitting there, and I was like, wow, this train is really loud. I don't know what's going on. This train is like a little too big, a little too fast. And it turned out it was a 4.5 earthquake. Uh, so, and it's actually, if you look on the Mercalli scale, there is between, I think, between a three and a four on the Mercalli scale, there's an, actually a difference between people who are lying down and felt the earthquake, and people, a four is people who were walking around doing something else and felt it. So there is, there is that, that kind of like, oh, if you were not doing anything else and you felt it because you were actually attentive. So I, I, I missed the, um, the DC earthquake because I was driving to teach a class. So I was in a car and I never felt it, just my phone started going off. So that's, that's the one I missed. <laughs> so then I had to wait for another five, five or six years until I was in California. So I was in an earthquake that I never felt. And I can share mine. Uh, I remember this very vividly. I was like eight years, nine years old, and the epicenter was very close to the region I lived in. So that was a 7.6 magnitude earthquake, mm -hmm. a huge one. And we used to stay like in the uh, ground floor, which is like which you consider the first one here. So people from the third floor started running, and we were the last ones to move out of the building. It was. Yeah. Something I'll remember very vividly. Yeah. Yeah. Where was uh, it was back in India. Um, it's a place called Surat. It's like I I know you wouldn't know the city, but it's like six hours from Mumbai, which is one of the major metropolitan cities in India. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and actually um, close to the, you know, the Himalayas. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so. Uh, then I should, I should probably say that. If you're ever in an earthquake, if you're ever traveling, if you're ever on vacation, two rules. If you start feeling an earthquake, get out of a building. Make sure there's nothing above you. Second rule, remember, aftershocks. Once the earthquake passes, don't go into your hotel to grab your passport. Just don't do it. Stay outside. Uh, they will tell you, usually there's times that passes that goes, that goes by. Again, one of the tragedies of the Turkey earthquakes is because that, that aftershock was so strong. And that does happen. Typically, we expect the aftershock to be one magnitude down, the second aftershock to be one magnitude down from the, second, from the first aftershock, and so on and so forth. But you do have scenarios where the aftershock is almost as strong as the main shock. So just stay outside. Yeah. <laughs> so typically, how long would, well, can you expect after, aftershocks? And is it, is it correlated with the ultimate you know, relative magnitude? So yes. Yeah, so typically, uh, it's hours to days. Yes, and uh, but not beyond that. Typically, we expect you know you, you know hours to days. Yeah. Oh, here's another question. So, an aftershock is actually a second earthquake. Oh yeah, it's a it's a whole new thing. And actually, it's kind of funny. How how do we tell what's the main shock and what's the aftershock? Well, the bigger one is the main shock. <laughs> it says we 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 decide that post factum almost. Uh, and there's four shocks main shocks and aftershocks. So you can have four shocks too. And again, that's actually that's a, that's another reason to never go in into a building because you don't know maybe that was the four shock. Maybe the big thing is coming. It was the warm up act. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, so earthquakes do fall sometimes, not always. Sometimes you have the, just the one big main shock and then aftershocks, but sometimes there's a four shock, main shock, aftershock sequence. So the aftershock can be bigger than the first. Shock. Nope. The then that would be the main shock. Yeah, so that's, that's yeah, it's, it's a moving scale. <laughs> I have another question. Um, now, we, again, we, you, you have six seismographs uh, here on, you know, on, on, on Copernic yep. property. Um, would, have, would that have uh, felt the, the Turkish uh, earthquake or the earthquake in Turkey? Uh, or is it, do you tend to be only, you, you'll only, uh, sense those uh, earthquakes that are in the same you know, tectonic plate? Actually, uh, the larger earthquakes from farther away are easier to detect oh. uh, because they're, it has to do with frequency attenuation. Mm -hmm. uh, so this, you, know, you know how when, when your annoying neighbor is playing music, you don't hear the lyrics, you hear the bass, right? And it's the same way for, uh, for earthquakes. The higher frequencies get attenuated faster, so, but for further earthquakes, you have these long period waves that travel further. So, and uh, 
to give you context, the 2004 Christmas Day earthquake in Sumatra, the energy of that earthquake went around the world, I think, 24 times. So um, an earthquake of a, of a magnitude 8 will be felt around the world by seismometers, not by people. But again, because these are very, by the time it gets here, it's very long period undulation. So you're not, it's not shaking. It's, it's actually lifting the ground very slowly up and very slowly down. So only a seismometer can sense that, but it's a very powerful wave. So the, to that, the, the, to me, it begs the next question is, is how fast is that wave propagate? You sure. said it went, went 24 times Absolutely. around. So through the Earth, uh, a typical primary wave propagates at about, um, in the mantle, about 8 kilometers per second. Wow. And in the crust, about 6.4 kilometers per second. That's yeah. about the same speed as the International Space Station. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, the, 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 again, the, it's, it, it's uh, you know, phys physical waves are, are very fast. The speed, of, the speed of sound is a physical wave, but that's because it's moving through, uh, um, through gas. That's why it's slow. And by slow, it's 330 meters a second, right? Uh, the same speed in, in the ground would be about 1,200 kilometer, uh, meters per second. Professor, what about earthquakes that occur under the ocean? Yes. Does the weight of all that ocean water um, make it harder to measure the size of the earthquake? Typically not. Uh, water is actually a very light substance. If you compare that to the actual weight of the rock, <laughs> right? So water is, doesn't really influence it as much. Uh, so if you again, if you compare if you if you compare a continent to an ocean, so a continent's actually thicker, has rocks in it, and ocean is water instead of the rocks, right? So it's actually easier. There's less weight on those on those on those faults. Yes, and the rule for uh, the rule of thumb for tsunamis is a, is a it's a magnitude eight. So you need a magnitude 8 earthquake about that to actually displace a column of water down enough to trigger a surface wave, which is a tsunami. So a tsunami is not like a wind wave. The wind wave can only move with the speed of the wind that it generated. So what's the fastest wind? Yeah, so what's the fastest? Like 100 miles an hour? Couple right. hundred. Couple hundred. Yeah, well, sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. A tsunami moves with the speed of a seismic wave. So yeah, it's 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 extremely fast. It, it, they they slow down as they approach the shore and they start cresting and they start kind of bunching up. But it's a completely different phenomenon. It's not a wave. It's an earthquake wave. Now I, I, I tend to think of tsunamis as a Pacific Ocean phenomenon. Yes. Do we are there similar situations in in the Atlantic or? Uh, yes, there have been tsunamis in the Atlantic. They're 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 usually related to volcanic eruptions, for example. Uh, okay. Um, and of course, the topic we didn't cover today is the nuclear, mm. nuclear option. Um, there are, there were during the Cold War, um, weapons that were developed to trigger tsunamis. Um, so, it, it is possible. All right. Yeah. Uh, okay. Any other questions here, uh, or anything else on the? All right. So from uh, Mike Blake, one of uh, Copernic's board of directors, uh, he asks, are there more earthquakes now than 50 or 100 years ago? Uh, there are more recorded earthquakes now because we have more instruments to record them. But no, it's probably, it's, 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 it's pretty standard. There's about, a, any given year, there's about a million earthquakes that, are, that occur, that are recorded. But again, most of them are on the uh, nonsense scale. And typically, you have about it's kind of it's it's, it's an interesting one where you have um, one magnitude eight, ten magnitude seven, hundred magnitude sixes, and so down. It goes up in the, the same way it goes up in size logarithmically. The same same way, oddly enough, it goes up in uh, count frequency. as well. Yeah, in frequency. So it's it's an interesting it's an interesting correlation there. So any given year, you could kind of expect there to be one, one major earthquake that's on, on kind of like on the, the Turkish uh, one. Uh, and then uh, lots of sevens, sixes, fives. But, but yet, I, I've heard news reports blaming earthquakes on climate change. Kind of, you know, that would be a, yeah, yeah no. <laughs> 
I think again, I think we again. This is I, I, I come back to this whole idea that unfortunately humans are we're 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 very fast on this on the, on the geological time scale, and we want to think we're important. And geologists make the worst psychologists because we will just tell you it doesn't matter. You don't matter. <laughs> All right. I think we may have another uh, <laughs> question from the from the live stream. All right. Uh, yep. And Randy asks: uh, Small quakes in California seem to stay local, while in Oklahoma they can be felt uh, from further away. Yes. Why is that? Uh, that's a that's a great question. It's and it has everything to do with actually the um, the surface uh, or near surface rock types. So the softer your rocks, uh, the uh, kind of the easier it is for waves to propagate. And in California, you're actually surrounded by mountains, and mountains act as uh, wave uh, distribution um, impedances. In Oklahoma, the reason there's oil in Oklahoma, it's all sedimentary. Sedimentary basins have a great job, do a great job of propagating waves further. So yes, it's true. Yeah. All right, well, um, thank you very much again. Thank you. Yeah, great, uh, great presentation. And th thank you for the wonderful questions. I, I really do appreciate that. Right. Was, this so, was a lot uh, of fun. Yeah. Yeah, so um, we'll take a uh, take another look outside to see uh, that the moon and Venus were up earlier. Uh, they may have set at this point, but we'll uh, we'll definitely invite you to come out next week. Uh, is actually a talk on hot air balloons. A uh, hot air balloon pilot is going to talk about a little bit of history of hot air ballooning, uh, what it takes to become a pilot, and and some of the experiences uh, on that. So. Uh, uh, look forward to having you back, either here in person or, or on the live stream. So thanks again.